I don't want to slip into a supremacist view of sacred ground community church and sangha. I don't want to think that, oh, we're better than that Methodist church down the road, or that we're superior to this other Buddhist group that's meeting over here. I like to think that, in the ideal at least, that these different ways of manifesting each have value, and that for one person, the ideal for you may be to go to that Presbyterian church in your neighborhood. And for somebody else, it may be to be um, part of the Sufi community or the Muslim community, or perhaps somebody else doing some other combination of traditions or um, some other practices. But I do think we offer some unique things that can be of particular benefit to people. One is, when we think of Christianity, there's a lot of different ways that Christianity has manifested over these 2,000 years, and also in any given time, like right now, how Christianity manifests. I'm interested in what Reverend Howard Thurman called not so much the religion about Jesus as the religion of Jesus. What was he here teaching us? What is he continuing to teach us? And so I think that gives us a different feel than some churches. I think that there are a lot of people within Christian tradition who have a great love of the music and the community and the teachings of Jesus and all this, and they feel that, oh, if they open the door at all to anything else, that they're doing something wrong. I know that in my position as a pastor, I've had people come up and ask me about that. Is it okay to look to these other traditions and, and, and gain insights? So part of this is we have this open environment where if you have an interest in things beyond the Christian tradition, there's room for that. There's one woman who came to our church she was interested in meditation, and she was told in the church that she had been in that there was no room for that. So I think that these are some of the things that we offer. Uh, I'm interested particularly in looking at the Bible through a vast lens. There's one Catholic priest who spoke of, and I'm gonna just paraphrase this because I can't remember exactly how he said it, but he said, we must be wary of the oppression of the one-dimensional meaning. Many of these stories have multiple meanings. Meanings have changed over time. Obviously, African-American slaves were singing about, let my people go. Those stories of Moses and the freedom of the people from Egypt those stories of the freedom from the Pharaoh had a whole new meaning that could not have been anticipated, you know, hundreds of years before people had discovered what we now call North America. The meanings will change and they can be added to and they can have different levels and different layers. And one of the things that I talk about is fresh green blessings, reading the Judeo-Christian Bible through a Buddhist lens with Mother Earth eyes. I specialized in eco-theology in seminary. So I'm looking for the strong environmental messages that can be found, sometimes explicitly, sometimes implicitly in the text. One example, the flood narrative that many of us know, the story of Noah. And we hear at the end of the new covenant that Noah makes with God. And God saying that he will not destroy Noah and his family anymore. And there's this whole new covenant. I invite you, go back, read the story, read the covenant. It is not only a covenant with Noah and his family. It is a covenant with all flesh, with all the animals, with all the plants, even with the earth itself, seven times seven is a sacred number, seven times God says this is a covenant with all of the earth. So that's where we start to get some different messages, some more possibilities, and a vaster view. I happen to be in the spirituality and religion business. This is about vastness. If we're going to be talking about God, if we're going to be talking about the great sacred, 
I mean, think about it. We now know that you could put your fingers together and have a little hole like this and aim it up at a dark piece of the sky. And if we had the telescopic view that we can now get with our telescopes, if we had the view, we would find not that there's thousands of stars in that little dot, but thousands upon thousands of galaxies containing millions of stars. Now, if we believe in some great sacred, some great mystery that has to do with all of this, we need an incredibly vast picture. We need a wide angle lens. <laughs> and so that's part of what we're aiming towards is by having that, the view from Christianity, the view from a sacred earth perspective, the, the perspective of Christianity, Buddhism, Earth, by having these different views, we start to get a little bit more of the picture. Do we get the whole picture? No. But we start to get a little more, a little more, a little more. And a lot of this is not about reasoning or logic. I can't sit here and convince you of anything, or if I can, <laughs> that's, that's problematic. It's about what Caitlin Matthews calls the subtle senses, a feeling, a resonance, an intuition, a sense that, oh, there's some sacred truth here. I feel it. I like what one of our parishioners, when she came up to me one time and she said, Michael, at today's service, I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit. And here's something maybe odd, but I think amazing. That person has a strong grounding in the Christian tradition. Someone else in our church might have a strong grounding in Buddhism. Someone else might see themselves as agnostic and just come for the mindfulness. Not everyone would use that same language as she had used about the presence of the Holy Spirit. And yet, she felt it and she felt the connection with these others. And they may have felt something too and described it with different words. And we were there together as one.